sit through a bunch of slides um, because the picture's worth a thousand words. And uh, let's, let's uh, go on through the slides. And then we'll have plenty of time for a question and answer and discussion. And um, all sorts of cussing and discussing at the end. So uh, let's run through. The farm is a polyface farm. It's located in Virginia, Shenandoah Valley, which I realize north of the border, you know, you may not remember, but in 1861 to 1865, there was, as we say in the South, a great wall. And uh, this great wall we call the War of Northern Aggression. And uh, the, the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia was the breadbasket of the Confederacy during the War of Northern Aggression. And uh, so, you know, our climate, uh, while it's different, I, I, I've heard from several people that there was some professor from the University of Saskatchewan or the University of Saskatoon or something on the radio today debunking this Virginian that's come up here and, uh, and said you can do pastured livestock in this area because it's too cold up here. You know what? I've got news for him. My neighbors don't think it can be done either. <laughs> so just remember that. Um, whatever you say, see, whenever you say it can't be done, you're right, it can't be done. Because if you don't think it can be done, it can't be done. Right? But you know what? There are people in this province that are doing it. And there's another axiom that if somebody's doing it and somebody has done it, it probably can be done. <laughs> so, uh, that guy probably doesn't know what he's talking about. But if you come into our farm, it'll be different than uh, most places. You'll see uh, animals out on the pasture. And we believe that um, the world is, is, is interconnected, interrelated. You know, but what we've got here in this great uh, North American developed uh, cultures at this point is we are a natural extension of the Greco-Roman Western reductionist, linear, fragmented, compartmentalized, disconnected, individualized, peace-oriented, it's all about me type of thinking. <laughs> and there's an equally valid paradigm or worldview that's from the East, that's holistic. We're all related. It's about connections, and we is worth more than I. And so it's in that respect of these two great worldviews that I come to you tonight trying to uh, examine both pieces and the soul part of, uh, of, uh, of, of Easternism. Now, if you move from the left of the screen, oh, this is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got open land, forest land, this is a pond, riparian area, but all landscapes have these three basic components of, on the landscape, forestal, riparian, and open land landscapes. The more we can intersect them, the more balanced and diversified the landscape will be. Now, it's always hard to know where to start when everything is cyclical rather than linear. So I'm going to start uh, at, at forest and go progressively through animals and different things. So uh, we start with the forest. And I realize that, that, that there isn't as much forest, certainly, here in this area as there is in Virginia. But uh, trees are valuable things to break up wind currents, to put on the edges of the field, to you know, keep the dirty 30s from happening again and um, to be especially down in the, in the bottoms and, and uh, to create protection. But, you know, in my typical, uh, stereotypical, I should say, everybody needs a pigeonhole, you know, so I'm just going to be very honest with you right now, give you my pigeonhole so you'll know where I stand on all issues, political, religious, and whatever, and that is I'm a Christian libertarian environmentalist capitalist lunatic. <laughs> so now you know where I stand on all issues. And so that capitalist part of me says the way we steward our woodlands is by adding value. If we can create value in a resource, then we will indeed create more uh, stewardship of it. And so we sell a lot of firewood, which uh, comes out of, the, out of the forest with our multiple use equipment. Notice this multiple use equipment. One of the biggest um, problems in industrial agriculture is the use of single use, highly capitalized, infrastructure that enslaves emotionally and economically the next generation into the previous generation's paradigm. You know, what happens with a confinement dairy situation, you know, that's full of uh, concrete and rebar and bankruptcy tubes, you know, silos, you know, what, 
What happens to that place when Junior walks in one day, or Juniorette walks in one day and says, Hey, Dad, Grandpa, guess what? Why don't we, these cows are herbivores, why don't we just turn them out and let them graze on pasture? Well, Dad and Grandpa go apoplectic seeds here. They spent their lifetime pouring concrete and rebar and building silos. You mean you're just going to walk away from it? We haven't even paid it all off yet. <laughs> and so when you have large single-use um, non-flexible infrastructure, it enslaves the next generation of the previous uh, generation's paradigm. So multiple-use equipment is as important as multiple-use land use. We bring the logs down and we run them through our bandsaw mill. This is the ultimate information type type agrarian infrastructure. You know, this is a this is a downsized, restructured, miniaturized, 800-pound uh, saw mill you can pull behind your Honda Civic to the woods and be in the lumber business. You know, worldwide, the um, lumber has the highest value-added percentage of any commodity in the world. What you sell for $100 on the stump brings $1,000 at Home Depot. And so what we want to do is instead of being a price taker, be a price maker, turn those logs into marketable value-added lumber that then we don't have to touch so many acres at a time to make some good income from the woodlot and therefore maintain value so we don't run cows in the woodlot and we you know, treat, the, treat the woodlot differently. So that's an important part. Now, the uh, branches we can stack with all the butts facing one way right through our chipper. Dad always called this our communist machine because it makes them all the same size. And that provides the bedding base for the barn in the wintertime for the hay shed. This is a very simple uh, pole structure. It's, uh, it's, 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 um, it's simply a pole structure. Not, it doesn't even have any sides on it. But uh, the cows then come into it to, it, to eat in the wintertime. Um, as opposed to this kind of situation where the cows are located all year round and the feed is always brought to them for, uh, you know, mechanically from fields. This is simply a very seasonal uh, situation. I know it doesn't look like the front page of you know, uh, successful farming, but the cows really don't care. The point is that the cows are dropping 50 pounds of material out their back end every day that's highly soluble and volatile. If it gets wet, it wants to um, leach into the groundwater because the soil is dormant and can't metabolize nutrients, organic, inorganic, or otherwise. And if it gets dry, it wants to vaporize and go off in the air. We all know what that smells like. So what we do is we use these wood chips that we uh, generate or we purchase from rights of way crews and things. Use those in the hay shed where we have vertically movable feeder gates on pulleys to accommodate the bedding buildup. So as the bedding builds up, uh, we just keep adding carbon to it to absorb all of these um, nutrients. And as it builds up then, the cows just keep moving up with the feeder gate. If we didn't have a movable feeder gate by spring, you know, the cows would be standing on their heads and it'd be kind of hard to swallow an egg. So uh, this way, it all moves up together. And the cows are tromping out the oxygen in this bedding pack, so it is actually in silent. So as we build that bedding pack, we add whole shell corn to it. The corn then ferments in that bedding pack and the cow hooves trough it all in, you know, and it becomes this, this huge, you know, three foot, four foot deep bedding pack that never freezes, even when it's zero Fahrenheit outside. It, um, it, it never freezes, it stays about 50 degrees, so the cows are lounging on, a, on an under, undergirded electric blanket, if you will, keeping them warm. The uh, bedding pack produces natural antibodies, things that keep the mastitis and pathogenicity down because the good bugs are beating out the bad bugs. And it's this wonderful smelling, uh, uh, clean, soft, deep bed full of fermented corn. So in the spring, we want to turn all this fermented bedding pack into aerobic compost. Well, how do you do that? Well, you've probably all seen these big, you know, windrow compost turners and all that stuff. Well, what we use are figurators. <laughs> and, you know, all pigs have a big sign across their forehead, we'll work for corn, especially <laughs> like fermented corn. <laughs> and so the pigs then go through and seep that corn, those corn pieces, and fling it and oxygenate it. Uh, that's why pig aerators, you know, P-I-G-A-E-R, like aerobic dance, you know, like, uh, you know, Jane Fonda, aerobic dance. Uh, Jane Fonda, left, 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 always left, left, left. So, yeah. <laughs> you astute political wonks, you got that. I appreciate that. So, all right. So, you've got these pigerators going through the bedding, all right? 
And of course, they love to do this. They're seeking out the corn kernels, and they're oxygenated, and they don't take any um, petroleum to run. They don't take spare parts or oil. They don't need minimum wage. What a retirement program when you're done with them, you eat them. You know? <laughs> When the animals do the work, suddenly the profit potential becomes size neutral because you're using appreciating infrastructure. These are tractors that we buy for 50 bucks and sell for 400. That's why I like to buy, you know, uh, uh, tractors. And you don't even have to steer them. I mean, they steer themselves and they just go through the bedding pack, you know, using the pile on the end of their nose. They just steer through there. We can go to the house and read. You know, the local, what's the name of this place? Research Center Sustainable, some UN law name. Anyway, you go read the portal and you open there and, uh, and, 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 you know, enjoy your winter instead of being out there driving machinery around. Now, here's the thing on these pigs. The beauty of this is this is truly hog heaven and it allows us to create a habitat that fully respects and honors the pigness of the pig. <laughs> And we think that that's really important because, you know, in our culture, the question is never asked, are the pigs happy? All we ask in industrial agriculture, mainline agriculture, is how can we grow them fatter, faster, bigger, cheaper? That's all that matters, right? Fatter, faster, bigger, cheaper. Well, intuitively, we all understand that's not a noble goal because if it were, we'd all aspire to be the fattest guy in a room. <laughs> What's healthy about faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper? I mean, that's why the average NFL player is dead at 57. You know, they're, when, you're, when your neck is bigger than your head, you're a freak of nature, and nature weeds you out <laughs> early. You see, we live in a culture, folks, in these industrial developed countries Western reductionists, remember that whole thing. Okay, we live in cultures today that view the pig as only an inanimate pile of protoplasmic structure to be manipulated however egocentrically and cleverly the human mind can conceive to manipulate it. And I submit to you that a culture which views life from that type of disrespectful, dishonoring, egocentric paradigm will view its citizens the same way and other cultures the same way. Suddenly, we have a moral ethic as a threat, don't we, that runs straight from the field to the fork. Suddenly, eating is a conscious act. Suddenly, the way we farm, the way we paint our landscapes, and what we choose to eat every day becomes a cultural, moral, sacred, noble statement. Now, I'm not here to tell you you can never have a Coke or Snickers bar again, okay? But if everybody had them as often as I did, they wouldn't exist. And they'd be some colloquial cottage industry, you know, that would be regionalized and decentralized and whatever, localized. Anyway, the point is that that we, we create daily the kind of landscape, the kind of resource protection that our grandchildren will inherit. And that is why. That's the why. See, in our culture, we spend a lot of time with the how. We become a, a, a culture of technocrats. And all we do is become technicians asking, how do we do this? How do we do this? Nobody sits back and says, why? I mean, we learned how to harvest Grains with GPS, satellite, and driverless tractors. But nobody asks, why are we feeding grain to herbivore? See, the why is the important question, and it's the one that we need to ask all the time. So, by fully respecting and honoring the pigness of the pig, it creates a happy pig, and it creates a foundation on the farm to honoring and respecting the merriness of Mary, the Thomas of Tom and the liberalism of liberals and the conservatism of the conservative way. Okay. So, uh, so the pigs go right on through and they do their wonderful work and they turn this into money. <laughs> I don't know what cow pies in Saskatchewan look like, okay, but that's the way ours look. And the problem is that we've taught, called our soil dirt and our manure we call waste. It should be you know, black gold or something. The point is that our weak link 
and our food systems and our farms is not, you know, some grant program or some government project or some agency or somebody else's genetics or somebody else's tractor, you know, the one that runs, uh, or somebody else's education. It's the weak link is between our ears to innovate and to access the resource base that's under our feet. Then, of course, uh, after the pigs are done with the preparing and the composting, of course, we can clean this compost out. It's now all nice and digested and composted. It smells just beautiful. I mean, you know, you can go out and just waller in it. It smells so good. And um, we put uh, trace minerals in with the compost as we spread it. Uh, some wood ashes in there and spread that back on the fields and that completes the cycle. So you've got the solar energy turned into forage, dried down into hay, gone through the cow, transmuted up to manure and urine, figurated into compost and back on the field. So the whole thing just cycles. And that has been our fertility program for 50 years. We have never bought a bag of chemical fertilizer. We've never planted a seed in 50 years. Then when the pigs come out and the compost comes out, then we can put poultry netting up and raise chickens in there. We sell a lot of ready-to-lay pullets. I mean, like, you know, thousands of dollars worth of ready-to-lay pullets for all of the uh, urban Dilbert cubicle refugees fleeing their global um, uh, machine niche in some whatever. And they come out to the country and, and get, you know, build their McMansion or their, you know, get their farmette or their little, uh, you know, ranchette or whatever, their, their, uh, Pleasant life in the country. Well, what, what they want is they want a few chickens, you know, that really be farmed. And so we supply their chickens for them. And, you know, our neighbors, of course, they, they say, oh, we don't want these people coming to the country. You know, we've got to gotta preserve this farm and all this stuff. Well, for a century, for a long time, farmers have been trying to uh, get their products to town, to customers. Well, now the customers are coming to us. Well, let's embrace them. I found out that I can't lift a guy's billfold unless I kind of embrace him and get close to him. I'll embrace him. <laughs> so, so these folks are coming out to our neighborhood. They've got expendable income. They've got money. And we let them buy our stuff. And so that just works fine. And if you don't like chickens in there, you can have uh, pigs. But the point is that we're using it for different things. Now, when the pigs are done, then they go out into the pig pastures. And they get local GMO-free uh, grain simple waterer, and every time they eat that one ton, they move to another quarter acre pig pasture. They get all the green material they want. They get to choose their salad bar and the uh, feeder. This is done with two strands of electric fence for a control, and the pigs are allowed to choose what they want to eat, and they tell me it's pretty cool. They can bowl, they can run, they can actually, you know, actually live and express their, again, express their pigness. Now, it is true that they touch that land pretty hard. Pigs are pretty rough on it, okay? But it's the short-term gain, the light tillage, that moves successional, the plant succession forward. You know, there's a lot of things in life that are like that. Short-term gain for long-term pain. You know, studying for exams is hard work, right? But it's kind of good to come out the other end and, and have it, have it um, productive, uh, get a good grade. Uh, you know, having that, that difficult conversation with the spouse, you know, that's difficult. But, you know, the pain of it gives gain out the other end. You can't live like that all the time, so you can't be in pain all the time. But short-term pain for long-term gain is really positive. It's the same thing with the landscape. So by, by using the one ton as a constant, it allows us to give enough impaction to the landscape that it moves succession toward grasses and away from brambles but not so much that it moves it away from grasses and into weeds. So there's a real narrow impaction window there that is that we have to then watch the management of so that we create this, this, um, this savanna landscape using pigs as a tool. Uh, this is just another shot of the electric fence and the way they burn it up like rice paddies, you know, between them. Um, and over time, what you do is just use pigs as a massaging landscape tool to create that. We've never planted a seed. All that is volunteer. It's in the seed bank, okay? And it's just 15 years of pig management and um, high density, short duration, portability, moving the pigs along. Now, once the pigs get to about 200 pounds, they go into uh, acorn finishing glens. We have a lot of hardwoods where we are, oak trees. 
And so we put uh, nylon insulators around the trees to just zigzag it from tree to tree. The nylon rope expands in the tree so it doesn't chafe the tree. We're not putting any nails or hardware in the trees to injure the trees. And it allows us to control those pigs so that they can fatten up then on the roots, the starchy roots of weed species, shrubs and things that compete with the oak trees. And then they eat the protein from the acorn. So they get to, you know, they get to balance themselves out, go through there. And what this does is offset uh, acre for acre and acre of grain. And over time then, they weed through the woodlot, they actually stimulate the um, composition of the carbon and the leaves and the organic matter, building black soil in the woods, aid in the development of the trees, and generate um, a lot of income in the woodland between timber harvests. So this is a way, again, to create more and more value in the woodlot so that it's better uh, stewarded. And when they're done, then they just uh, march down the road and come home to go to the abattoir. So the pigs are a landscape tool that, uh, that works. All right, now we go to open land management. We're going to deal with herbivores. Uh, open lands around the world are how these fertile soils were created over the millennia. Well, how were they created? They were created with herbivores. Buffalo, wildebeest, Cape buffalo in Botswana. So when you look at these herbivore populations around the world, you see three primary things that they do. They're three M's, so it's real easy to remember. The first one is they're always moving. They don't stay in the same place. They're moving to fresh grass. They're moving away from yesterday's campsite, which has pathogens and stuff in it. All right, so they're moving. The second thing is they're mobbed up. They're mobbed up, who knows why? Predators, thank you. Yeah, because the camera man's around, there's some lion, leopard, whatever, you know, over there working in the bushes. Well, those, that, that, that mobbing completely changes the sociological function of the herd. It makes them graze less, um, less selectively. You see, all animals have a palatability index, just like you and I do. I don't know about you, but I'm a very discriminatory ice cream eater. <laughs> I only eat ice cream if I'm alone or with somebody. <laughs> well, cows have their palatability index too, all right? But when they're in a mob situation, they learn, you know what, if I don't eat this morsel right now, it's not going to be there after 200, you know, come behind me in the next 10 minutes, so I better eat it now. And that aggressive grazing makes them equal plant eaters, like equal employment opportunity, you know, equal plant eaters, less selective, and they fill up and tank up faster. And, and that makes them more productive and efficient because the faster they tank up, the more time they have to ruminate. An animal doesn't, an herbivore does not make meat or milk when they're grazing. They only make it when they're chewing their cud. Well, they can't graze and chew their cud at the same time. And so the faster they fill up, the more time they spend meditating and thinking about what they ate. Right? <laughs> I think it's fascinating that the root of medita you know, meditation is, is, is chewing. Uh, it's, it's, it's the herbivorous cud idea. Right? And so uh, maybe that should give us pause to think about maybe we ought to spend more time uh, meditating and not so much time just you know, taking in information. Maybe we need to sometimes sit down and just chill out and try to metabolize what we took in all day. Anyway, um, so the cows are, are stimulated to spend more time chewing their cud when, they're, uh, when they graze aggressively. All right, and the third M is they're mowing. You know, they're not eating dead cows, chicken manure, dead chickens. I mean, both the Canadian and the U.S. ag, industrial ag professionals, you know, all the people with the PhDs behind their names, took, spent 40 years taking farmers like me around to, you know, uh, steakhouse dinners, teaching us this new scientific method for feeding herbivores. It's called, you know, we take dead cows, we grind them up, we cook them, and we feed them back to uh, cows. And farmers like me said, oh, there's something wrong with this. An herbivore is not a carnivore, it's not an omnivore, it's an herbivore. Of course, the scientists dismissed us as kooks, remember? And prudes, and, and you're, just, you're just not scientific. The avatar that we just bought, the owner who's in his uh, 80s now, and that's why he was decided it was time to retire, um, 
He, he told me he quit buying Shenandoah Valley uh, beef because we have so much poultry in our area to generate so much manure. What do you do with it? Well, what does anything, what do we do in our cultures when we generate too much of anything? We feed it to cows. And so, um, or you know, after World War II, you have all this anhydrous ammonia. What do you do? Well, you dispense it on the land. You know, I mean, you just, just you dump it. And so, um, so the cows are the same way. And he said, I quit buying Shenandoah Valley beef when I kept walking in my chill tank and it smelled like a chicken house. At the same time, of course, our great school, Virginia Tech, uh, that everybody bows to, you know, all the conventional farmers, uh, was telling us there's no scientific evidence that there's anything wrong with feeding, you know, dead cows to cows. They didn't call it feeding dead cows to cows. They called it efficient. They called it uh, growing them faster, better, bigger, cheaper, which is the noble goal that we've already talked about. Well, isn't it amazing that here we are 40 years later and this, there's this big collective, oops, maybe we shouldn't ought have done that. And isn't it pretty amazing that the very specialists and, and pseudo-scientists that told us to do that for 40 years in those agencies are now trying to posit themselves as the, as the uh, repository of food safety. Folks, remember, whatever you see from the official government industrial expert food establishment is not true. Just mark it down. Whatever it is, it isn't true. Okay? We can just get that one thought through our heads and we'd be in good shape. Alright, so all we're doing here is mimicking natural grazing patterns of herbivores. We've got what are the three M's? We've got moving, mobbing, and mowing. Essentially that cow is a great big four-legged, four-wheel drive sauerkraut bat. <laughs> Portable. Okay? And so she's eating forages. And so all we're doing is taking those three M's as a natural pattern, laying them down into commercial domestic production, say, how can we most closely approximate this technique? And so the cows come out in the spring, um, and we move them every day to a fresh spot. They begin compensatory gain from uh, the winter. We don't give them any grain or silage or anything in the winter. So they come in the spring just a little bit ragged, you know, kind of like deer and buffalo do coming into the spring. But they put on that compensatory gain in the spring. Our tool is the electric fence. We're not Luddites. We love high technology, but the only technology that allows us to enhance the talents of the cow and, and create biomimicry, all right? And so that's what it's for. And so that allows us to control them and move them where they need to be. We become the wolf then. We become the panther to move them and create that management uh, effect. So there's a lot of rest period before we come back to an area. Very simple, very simple electric fencing. We're taking it up and putting it down every day. And as the cows get disciplined to this, of course, they can just, uh, you can just handle them and move them easy. So this is, this is a very light footprint, gentle uh, material. Now, so those cows are moving along and the grass is beginning to grow ahead of them, and then we can stockpile it on the stalk for later grazing. So this is August now, middle of the summer, it's dry, you know, we're in a drought, everything's dry as a bone, all the creeks have dried up, and we've got this bank of standing forage ahead of the cow. All our neighbors, they're out there feeding hay and running diesel and driving on their, you know, being John Deere jockeys all day. Yeah, that's why I've decided these organic farmers, you know, or beyond organic, I can't use the word, the word organic because you know, I'm not certified, so it's illegal for me to use the word organic. So I'll just say I'm beyond organic. They don't like that either. And anyway, um, so, so here we are out here. Uh, we're just moving these cows around, and uh, everybody else is out there, you know, running their machinery. And I've decided that, that, that those of us that farm this way, we've got to be systems. I mean, it's just not... It's just not um, a machismo. It's not manly to come in and, you know, the adoring wife Matilda sees, you know, Harry come in, you know, her big uh, hunk of a Harry, you know, and, and uh, he comes in and, and, and Matilda says, oh, my man, you know, what have you done all day? And he says, oh, I think the cow's happy. <laughs> it's a lot more manly to say, man, I've been out on a tractor. Uh, here, smell the grease and the diesel fuel. I've, I've had pig iron under my thighs all day. I mean, you know, this has been, a, I've torn up the ground and buried earthworms and sprayed, you know, pesticides. I'm, that's a man. <laughs> well, I think we can do with it a little more nurture in our culture. What do you think? Right. So, so these cows, um, so they're, they're coming, and uh, we're just moving them right along. Here we are. This is called 
mob stocking or vivorous solar lignified carbon sequestration fertilization. <laughs> this is 100 cows on a quarter of an acre a day. Okay? So they move in, and uh, a lot of you think, oh, there's nothing to eat there. There's a lot to eat. All right? Just giving you some shots to show you the volume here, all right? But the point is that we've allowed that grass to grow to physiological expression so that it goes through its pinnacle of physiological expression to metabolize way more solar energy than it can if it's kept short all the time and continuously grazed, like most people do. And uh, just the volume is, is unbelievable. Remember, what's under the soil is a, is a bilaterally symmetrical uh, mirror image of what's above the ground. So when you have that much above the ground, you have that much below the ground that you're injecting as organic matter into the ground. So it's that, it's that rest period and that physiological expression. So we don't graze it, we don't give access, but maybe two or three times a year to any individual paddock. You can see there after they've left, you can see again the, 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 tight, the tight graze line. And um, so those cows are mobbed on there. They're tight, it's like a, a corral, but they're moved every day to a fresh spot away from yesterday's, um, uh, away from yesterday's area. And uh, just, for, just for impact, uh, the, the shot up on the top, that is um, in the middle of the summer in uh, Botswana, uh, Cape Buffalo, <laughs> down here. This is us. I want you to notice the biomimicry. It's a world apart, but it's the same principle. All right, it's the same principle. Now here's the deal, folks. If everybody in the world that had cows, if everybody in North America that had cows, practiced this kind of biomimicry, the additional biomass, solar energy converted to biomass that would be created by this kind of biomimicry, in less than 10 years, we would sequester all the carbon that's been emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Age. It's really that simple. So you see the radical environmentalists that demonize the cow as being the greatest environmental disaster and the best thing you can do is to not eat any uh, meat anymore are missing the point entirely. Amazingly, the animal that's caused so much environmental destruction, the cow, is not the culprit. It's the manager of the cow. Because you see, it was the wolf, the buffalo, the fire, and the, pred and the predatory Native American that created these deep soils that we're still mining with, with, with erosive tillage, small grain, and corn. You know, Sir Albert Howard, the godfather of modern compost, he said, it is the temptation of every generation to turn what nature took millennia to build into cash. And that's exactly what we've been doing for the last century. You and I are living in an unprecedented time of human experimentation. Never have humans uh, treated their land on this grand a scale any time in civilization. And so, and, and what we're doing to it, of course, is a grand experiment. So here we are in February, the other dormant season when the grass stops. This is 80 cows on half an acre a day. Same idea, stockpile forages. This is rental ground, all right, moving the cows around. What this does is that it creates so much more uh, solar energy conversion into biomass that it becomes the most efficacious land healer possible. Now, water becomes critical. How are we going to get water to them? Well, we don't want the cows to go into, you know, ponds like this or impoundments because, you know, they pee out the back end, drink in the front end, and, you know, if you drink out of your toilet, you probably have worms too. So what we want to do is get this water in a pipe and get it in a tank, a nice, clean, sanitary tank. So this is very simple infrastructure. A lot of people say, oh, you know, these, these uh, natural farmers, they don't buy anything. You know, they just, they just um, you know, the men grow ponytails and wear sandals and run naked through the woods on moonlit nights and the women don't shave their legs, you know, and everybody just kind of sits back and lets the nature take its course. Well, that's not really true. We do spend money, okay? We do. But we like to spend money on things that are once a 500-year expenditure. That's the way I like to spend money, all right? And so what we do, we have a lot of uh, buried water lines. We use a full flow valve in the tank. Simple buried water lines. This is the kind of infrastructure we use. And uh, at home, we have five miles of water lines that, uh, that allow us to water the cattle. Simple mineral. Uh, this is another rental farm here. You can see where they were uh, yesterday, where they moved on to today. 
Uh, and you notice, you know, that the previous guy that was there, of course, the cows were just going everywhere, running in ponds down in riparian areas. Well, uh, what happens is the cows are always mounting up on top of the hill because the cows want to lounge up there in order to watch for wolves. I mean, they've still got a little bit of natural instinct left in them. And so what we do is we fence along the key lines so that we can make sure that the cows put the manure where they graze instead of translocating all the time and, and taking it to favorite campsites. This way you get your fertility moved around better and, um, and, and it just works. Well, shade becomes a critical factor. So, uh, of course, cows like to lounge up under trees to become incubators for pathogens and parasites. So we have a 1,000 square foot portable loafing shelter big enough for 100 head that we can move around like a portable shade tree and put the manure where we want it instead of where the cows want it and spread it out in the pasture as a, as a part of the fertility program. Water becomes the situation. What do you do? Well, we build, we build a lot of ponds. We gravity feed. We've got five miles of water line at home. This is no pumps, no energy, no electricity. Gravity fed 80 pound pressure water over the whole place. This is the kind of infrastructure we do. Then you can irrigate with it to maintain solar metabolism in a dry time so you can continue to metabolize solar energy in the biomass. So this is the way we, we create additional carbon sequestration and solar metabolism into, into carbon, which is really what runs the whole earth. Well, those cows drop the calling card, and you look at these uh, little manure pads and you say, well, now I wonder how nature sanitized behind these cows before, you know, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals and Merck Pharmaceuticals came along. I mean, you talk to these salesmen in these pharmaceutical companies and wonder how in the world these cows ever survived until, you know, without a bunch of, you know, implants and rub-ons and rub-asides and warmers and everything else. Well, how they survived? Well, guess what? Birds followed herbivores. You know, you look at any herbivore population around the world, you know, the egret on the rhino's nose, the birds follow the herbivores. So we have the eggmobiles, and the chickens then free range out from the eggmobiles and stretch into cow pegs in very simple trailers. There's 800 birds here in this uh, pair of eggmobiles, very simple slatted floor, um, trailer type structure, nest boxes inside, and they just follow the cows in the pasture rotation, and the chickens then. Uh, lay eggs as a byproduct of the pasture sanitation program. So we take an, a, a, a liability, the fly larva and the grasshoppers and crickets in the pasture, turn that into eggs, which becomes an asset. So you're, what you're doing is, is you're actually building synergistic symbiotic relationships, multispeciated on that farm landscape. It's all about developing relationships. You see, that's what industrial agriculture doesn't want to do. They don't want any relationships. They don't even want people on the farm. <laughs> you know, in fact, they've been so successful at removing people from the farm that at least in uh, the U.S. we now have twice as many people incarcerated in prisons as we have on farms. And we think that's such a successful culture, we should export that around the world for everybody else to be like us. What a joke! So the, 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 so, the, so the chickens then scratch through the cow patty, they sanitize it, they spread it out into a much bigger area so it covers a much bigger area and you don't have this pool, this bellyache in the soil from too much um, uh, manure in one spot. So they, they take this little, you know, this little pumpkin pie cow manure and they spread it into a great big area that then the soil can metabolize and eliminates uh, repugnancy zones for the cows and of course cleans it up and metabolizes it and turns it right into eggs. So we collect thirty to forty thousand dollars worth of eggs as a byproduct of the pasture sanitation program. Okay? Real simple. We put the eggs away, of course. So the question is, which would you rather live next to? See, one of the problems in industrial agriculture is that we've created these aromatically and aesthetically repugnant models that nobody wants to live next to. And so when nobody wants to live next to them, we've taken the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker and chased them out of the village because they've become humanly repugnant. And whenever we take a sector of the economy and send it out into Yon Hill, out of sight, out of mind, that sector, trust me, begins taking environmental, ethical, nutritional, and economic shortcuts. And the only way to restore integrity in our food system is to create transparency in our food system, which comes from the accountability from reinserting the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker into the community where people see what goes in the front door, what comes out the back door. 
That's the way to redo it. And what it requires then is an aromatically, aesthetically romantic <laughs> model that attracts people to it like magnets rather than repulses them. And so these are the models that will allow that to happen. It's a beautiful landscape. This is the feather net, egg production. Here, we're not trying to sanitize the pastures, we're just trying to uh, do pastured eggs using high-tech uh, polyethylene electric netted fencing that keeps black bears and coyotes and foxes and raccoons and badgers and predators out and the chickens in. I mean, who would have thought 50 years ago that you could have that kind of uh, fencing that uh, 150 feet of it only weighs 12 pounds and one person can take it up and put it down in 10 minutes. I mean, it's cool. This is, this is the high-tech stuff we have today to work with to create, ultimately, a situation that is more hygienically chicken and ecologically friendly and enhancing than a backyard chicken flock in a dirt, non-portable yard on a, on, a, on a homestead 80 years ago. It's an exciting time to be alive. Trust me, with this kind of infrastructure, and we just, of course, move them every two days. This is a thousand birds. Move them every, every three days to a new quarter acre. Everything's just on skids, chained together like a train, and it just comes into the next lot. When you have this kind of technology applied to the pasture idea, there is no reason, end of discussion, period, no debate, not one reason in the world for a single concentrated animal feeding operation. Period. Ever. Not one reason. Okay? Um, very simple, just a little battery energizer there, electric netting. Uh, it's just beautiful. The chickens are happy. We use guard dogs if necessary as an additional level of protection because nature's not always, you know, throwing you a kind of little soft ball. Sometimes they come disguised as um, marauding feathered themes. Uh, not that one. Uh, things that eat those. And so, but this is great, this beautiful uh, landscape. In the wintertime, of course, it gets too cold, uh, freezes up, good snow and all that, so they come into tall tunnels. So you've got the chickens, you've got the uh, rabbits, so you've got pigs in there, so you've got pigs and chickens and rabbits. The point is that none of the densities is at a density to kick in pathogenicity. And each species becomes a pathogen cul-de-sac for the other species. So you've got all of these completely confused pathogens saying, I'm a, I live in rabbit turds, but, but I'm surrounded by chicken turds. What am I going to do? <laughs> so what this does is completely confuse the pathogen world. And they can never build up virulence because they're always confused. And then when the chickens and everything comes out in the spring, you can grow vegetables in there and make thousand dollars of the vegetables as a byproduct of the housing for the winter um, animals. So all of this, again, uh, works together seasonally. Then you've got turkeys in a vineyard. You've got turkeys under a hay wagon in a pasture, same netting, all right? Multiple use, uh, multiple use pasture, multiple use fields, uh, hoop houses with pigs in them. And then in, in the winter and then in the summer, it's a racking house with chickens under rabbits. Okay, racking rabbit, rabbit chicken, <coughs> racking house, okay? The, the, the rabbit urine is providing moisture to uh, make bugs and compost. The chickens aerate under the rabbit uh, shelters. We just add carbon to it all the time to compost uh, and grow roly polies and little millipedes and stuff. The chickens, of course, are laying eggs, but you're getting a stackable symbiotic relationship again in the facility so that the rabbits can stay healthy and they're not, you know, getting this ammonia bath coming up from their uh, urine and feces. The chickens are incorporating that in the air, in the, um, the aerated compost and bedding. That keeps the chickens real happy because they're scratching through getting fresh animal protein. Of course, it keeps the rabbits happy. If you don't like chickens under them, you can have pigs under them. The point is that we're always looking at how to use more of that cubic hair space and uh, air space to create more symbiotic relationships. Then the rabbits can come out into the uh, pasture in floorless, um, uh, slatted floor uh, hairpins. Then we move every day to a fresh spot. And then we process them right there. Uh, that's our son Daniel. Daniel's had the rabbits since, since uh, his early 4-H days. And uh, the way he selects breeding stock, this is what's cool when you have multiple, you know, multiple animals in a, in a litter. Uh, he actually selects them based on their internal organ health. You know, we don't select animals on, on size. We don't select animals on color. We select animals on health. Well, that's a novel concept. Imagine. 
Yeah. What we do in industrial agriculture, though, is we just give everything antibiotics and vaccines and, and crutches, and then we never know what the weaknesses are. We wonder, why is our population walking around with all the diseases we've got? Well, probably because we've got animals that we haven't been selecting for health. We've been selecting for non-noble characteristics, and, uh, you know, it makes, uh, makes an uh, unbalanced world. Of course, the cats get into the picture, too. Uh, they enjoy getting in there as well. Lots of relationships. All right, then uh, we come to the chicks with the brooder. Now, we don't throw everything out that the industrialists have done because they've been doing some cool things, you know, like four-wheel drive tractors and electricity and all sorts of stuff. And uh, brooders are one of the things, and nipple waterers are another. And so the chicks then can, uh, can drink out of these nipple waters. They're real clean. And uh, we use a lot of deep bedding. We build this thing so the bedding can build up to about 24 inches. We never clean it out completely. So we leave inoculant in there for the next season. See, what we don't want is sterile. What we want is a medium that allows the good bugs to beat the bad bugs. That's what we're trying to do. And so we divide the chicks up into smaller groups. And, uh, and the hovers, of course, keep them warm. And the chicks then can scratch in that good CN ratio, about 25 or 3 to 1 bedding that grows its bugs and all that and it provides some incentives for the chicks to scratch in. It makes a, a beautiful chick, low mortality, no vaccines. When they hit about 14, 15 days, we load them up and um, put them in crates and head to the pasture with them. We put them on a trailer and bring them out to the field into portable, floorless field shelters. And those field shelters then um, provide protection from predators, protection from weather. We move them every day to a fresh spot. It's like a fleet of you know, geese flying down through the field. And uh, we move them every day, put a dolly under one end, go out to the other end, pull it. The chickens just walk up the path to the next spot. You can see where, the, where they vacated. There's no, uh, again, high density short duration. Been here for one day, and then here's a recovery in a few days. And it, and it just grows more, gra uh, more grass and clover. Uh, again, we've never planted clover, all right? It just comes up volunteer when you get everything right. I mean, this stuff is in the seed bank, and it just waits to be told, you know, okay, it's all right to come out now. And then it has to come up. Uh, and so the chickens are out there on the pasture, moved every day, using uh, waterers, very simple watering systems, dip and carry. Again, this is our gravity-based uh, water system, dip and carry out to the shelters, everything close by, uh, hand done. Then the turkeys, of course, they like to move a lot and get around on more ground, so we use them with the gobbly go. This is a 30-foot by 48-foot portable structure, again, using the netting, uh, moving these turkeys every couple of days, and it's beautiful. And if our food production is not beautiful and not sensually romantic, it's not good. I mean, God gave us our senses so we know what's infectious. I mean, how do we know that if we have a wound? How do we know it's infected? It smells. It starts to stink, right? Well, why is it that we go around and pass legislation right to farm laws that are basically right to stink up the neighborhood and the, and the industrial farmers say, oh, this is, this is just country air. It's not country air. It's bad farm production. It's bad food production. That's what it is. And if food production is done correctly, it will never smell obnoxious. Um, it, you know, it should be essentially romantic so that children want to be involved, so that children like to be involved, so that everything is balleting on the pasture uh, at the appropriate time, at the right time. Then we come into our uh, illegal processing facility, <laughs> and uh, we back up there with the birds, uh, kill them in these killing cones, and you got the stall with the finger, eviscerate by hand. Uh, notice all the smiles of people, the place, you know, it's a community-based endeavor. Uh, with eight people here, we can run 200 birds an hour, which is just as efficient as the industrial plants, by the way. And uh, very little overhead. We're not, we're not spreading feathers all around the countryside. Everything is kept there uh, on the place to give us a chicken that's unbelievable in the world. And uh, then we compost all the guts that are feeding them back to the chicken like the industry does. We compost them right on site with, of course, carbon. And um, everything runs on carbon. You know, the first thing you should see at a, at a true blue, uh, you know, beyond organic farm is uh, mounds of carbon. And when it's over, it's over. I can come to um, Regina and visit a few wonderful folks. So there's a seasonality, a, a pulse and a heartbeat, a, a cycle to this that's seasonal. There are sprint times and there are rest times. But what we've done in industrial agriculture is we don't want people on farms. We don't want people around.
pile of food. We don't want people anywhere, but we'll sure take your money when you finally go into Walmart and get a skew pack, slotted feed, uh, beep button, bottom, uh, skew number package. What we want are people to come to the farm and get in touch with their food supply. So the industrial food system, this is what they've got stopped down here. You know, that's what they've got everywhere. And of course, what that basically is saying is our animals uh, have such a terrible immune system uh, that we've uh, destroyed their immune system that we can't let you come and you might get sick. Instead, we want you to come and be invited to build a bridge instead of a barrier, to build relationships, to build, um, to, to handle, see, touch, and, and get the story of your farm, build a memory, so that when you sit down to that intimate dining experience, you know, really, eating is a fairly intimate experience. I mean, that's the act of marriage. That's a pretty intimate thing. We're taking this, we're ingesting it into our body. It's a pretty intimate thing. What we've done is we have been, we have become so anti-human in all the elements leading right up to the dinner table that, that we, we've lost our dinner dance partner. We, you know, it's not a courtship, it's not a romance, it's not a relationship that we know anymore. It's just like a, like a, a one night stand, a prostitution deal. You know, who knows what I'm eating? I mean, it says it's on the label, and what's on the label I can't even pronounce. It's some foreign language. You know, we don't know anything about it. And so, and so as we create this embedded food system in our communities, in our neighborhoods, we again develop the memories and the links and the warm fuzzies so that people have a relationship with their food and they can sit down and dine with knowledge of this intimate dance partner. And that allows us to dance again with a partner for knowledge that fills not only our stomachs but our souls with the relationships that we cultivate by being on the land, being connected, and being knowledgeable about it. One of the things that we enjoy doing is food fairs. One of the favorite things that we do is we'll cook sausages on site, cook them in, cut them in half, give them on toothpicks, and we give them as samples to the children of vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> we always find that, you know, recovering vegetarians are always our best customers. What's the fact that they can heal the planet with pasture-based livestock, and they got a binge to make up for lost time. <laughs> Instead of 
uh, nameless, faceless corporate agendas from a thousand miles away outsourcing the directives for our piece of landscape. What it does is it allows us to insource the decisions to build uh, roots, heritage, olive tree relationships, if you will, in our community with our land, with our livestock, with the earthworms under our feet to romance the next generation as the 4-H motto says from my community, my country, and my world, and indeed in the process find the passion of our hearts, the dream that we, that we fantasize about and think about and promote around the world, and that is a world in which we, are, we, we have connections to our food, we have connections to our farmer, and we, we are healing the land, and we're building a landscape full of happy, dancing, copulating earthworms. And that is a land that we can, and a legacy that we can leave to our grandchildren because it's a bigger, better legacy than we have received in our lifetimes. Let us be passionate. Let us be uh, excited about the nobility and the sacredness that we can bring to our plate every day. Thank you very much for letting me visit with you.